Chat with Traders, episode 76. The biggest secret of the best traders in the world is that they're just like everyone else. However, they've worked hard to learn the markets and discover what works and what doesn't. But how can you hear about these journeys and get in on the strategies and tactics they use? You can do it by listening to Chat with Traders. Here's your host, Aaron Fifield. We have a brilliant new sponsor on the podcast this week, TradeStation, the online broker that enables you to trade multiple products and markets using a single integrated trading platform. Whether you trade equities, ETFs, futures, or options, TradeStation gives you direct access to all the major US exchanges and more. Learn all about TradeStation's expansive product offering and why traders trade with TradeStation by visiting tradestation.com today. Hey, what's up team? How are you doing? I'm Aaron Firefield and it's so good to have you listening. As you heard there, I've got TradeStation sponsoring the podcast this week and for the next few weeks, which I'm really stoked about. They're a very reputable broker, so make sure to check them out uh, at tradestation.com. Now, my featured guest for this week's interview is Saul Knapp. Saul originally started out as a runner on the floor of the Life Exchange in London when he was just 16 years old. Later, moving on from there, he's had various roles as a risk manager for proprietary trading firms, at times monitoring positions for as many as 120 traders. Today, Saul lives in Spain, where he runs a small prop firm of his own. In regard to how he trades, Saul is a spread trader who's most active in the energy markets. So spread trading is something we definitely cover during our conversation here as well as his observations from being a risk manager and helping other traders to improve uh, as his role as the owner of a prop firm. If you have any questions or if there's anything which you'd like further explanation on, just write in the comments at chatwithtraders.com forward slash 76 and Saul will respond to you as he's kindly offered to do so. All right, well, let's get to the interview. Here is episode 76 with Saul Knapp. Hey Saul, how's it going man? I'm good, yourself? I am doing really well. Thank you so much for coming on. I know we're going to cover some really interesting and quite important topics, but let's start as per usual with how you first got started in this business. I think you may have only been 16 at the time, but Saul, share with us how you first got started. For some reason, I always wanted to be a trader. I think uh, maybe from the films when I was young and just, you know, general uh, interest in trading. And uh, I got started on the life floor in 1992. My dad's friend was a broker there. And, uh, he got me an interview, which was in a, a small pub in Cannon Street. And uh, I started the following week as a runner. Okay, and I'm just curious, what were some of those movies that, that got you into trading? Um, silly, silly as it sounds, uh, Trading Places with Eddie Murphy. Uh, as much as it wasn't completely focused on trading, I just liked the look of it. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I actually watched a movie on the weekend, um, kind of old school, uh, Rogue Trader. It just popped up on yeah, Netflix. I like that. Yeah, great movie. Really, really cool. So you were very young when you first started out um, on the floor. What were your first impressions like as a 16-year-old? Was it anything like you'd kind of seen in the films or was it a totally different experience? It was quite strange because um, I've never, never been – a shrinking violet. I'm, I've always been fairly confident, but being a 16-year-old boy, I look back now and think, really, I was a boy. And the minute them doors opened when I walked onto the floor, I couldn't believe that just the sheer noise coming from the trading floor and how how on earth was I going to work in this? <laughs> so how did you go during those, those first couple of years? Did they sort of... Um you know, did you understand your role fairly well or did was there anything that was particularly challenging or you struggled with? Um, maybe if you could tell us a little more about what your actual position was as a floor runner. Well, originally I was a floor runner for about 10 traders. They traded Euromarks, Buns, um, BTP. Um, I was, yeah, there was 10, 10 traders. They weren't very big traders. And... Um, to be honest, at first I didn't have a clue. I was just sort of thrown in the deep end. There's your 10 traders. Go and click their cards, write their positions down, work their positions out, work their P&Ls out, and make sure their trades match off. It, was, it wasn't It was really uh, someone showing you how to do it. It was just, there you go, go and do it. So, uh, yeah, I didn't really have a clue to start with. Right, right. 
So after a couple of years, I, from what I understand, you actually moved on to become an actual trader on the floor. How did you go with this? Did you pick that up fairly quickly or did it take you uh, some time to actually reach a level where you were profitable on the floor? To be honest, I was never actually profitable on the floor. I, I started in the bun pit on the tail end of when the bun migrated to screens onto uh, DTB or Urex as we know it now. So uh, I went in the pit when a lot of people were finding it tough. And um, I never really made any money, to be honest, on the floor. Okay, so did you lose significant amounts of money? Like, what, what do you think prevented you from actually being able to, to make money on the floor? Um, I think it was going straight into the buns when the bun was being, it was a life bun, and uh, it was being overtaken in volume by the Eurex bun. And I think it was just getting very difficult to actually trade it. Even the big traders, experienced traders, were either going to a different pit or just leaving the floor. They, uh, I didn't lose significant amounts. It was, you know, it wasn't a lot at all, really. But it was, um, it was just very difficult. And to be honest, I don't think I was prepared enough as an eighteen-year-old and not really knowing what I should have known. So you eventually left the floor. Um, what was the reason behind this? Was it due to the fact that you were struggling to make money, or did it have anything to do with um, electronic markets coming in, or or? Tell us a little bit about the reasons why you moved on from the floor. A bit of both, really. The company I was working for, uh, they were leaving the floor to go completely electronic. They pretty much had this set up, and um, I wasn't really part of it, to be honest. And I was offered a job with one of the big clearers as a law manager, and then subsequently they took me on as a assistant risk manager up in the back office. So I managed all the traders on the floor, and all the traders, electronic screen traders, and the new groups of traders that had sort of been created. So I went into the, uh, the main office of the bank and was a risk manager. Okay, interesting. That's really cool. So how long were you there as a risk manager for? I know you've also done this later in your career, which we're going to get to, but um, for, for that point, how long were you a risk manager for? Was it, was it a couple of years? Yeah, it was about just under two years, I would have said. I was assistant risk manager. And the head of risk, he was, he was a really good guy and really good at his job. Um, you know, we used to sit down every day, he used to teach me about options risk and what I needed to know about options risk. So I learned a lot more than just basic vanilla futures and you know, just buying and selling basic you know, strategies. I learned a lot more about options risk as well. And um, yeah, I've done it for about two years. Okay, okay. So tell us about your next move on from there when you, when you I think you went to join a prop firm of some sort. Tell us a little bit about that. That's right, yeah, in 2000, end of 99, I got made redundant as the um, company decided they didn't want to do proprietary trading anymore. It was only going to do uh, banking business. So uh, I had a, a contact from the life floor and um, he was starting a small prop shop. So uh, I went to see him about January 2000 and um, I started with him in February 2000 in a small office above Cannon Street. I think there was six of us and a risk manager and an IT guy, like a small attic with us crammed in and that was like a, a little sweat room really but it was, it was good. <laughs> okay and I believe the, the guy who funded um, that prop firm, it was a kind of an interesting story. Um, actually lived in the States. He was a wealthy individual. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, do you know what? I never actually knew who the funder was, but he was a wealthy individual from the States, yeah. I don't actually know who he was. Uh, he funded it. It was kept quite quiet from me. And yeah, that's, that's as much as I know to this day, to be honest. <laughs> okay, awesome. Now, what were you doing at the prop firm? You Obviously, you were a risk manager in your past job, you come into the prop firm. Were you actually a trader uh, on the desk there? Yeah, when I was working for the bank previous to this, so I used to watch all the on-screen traders. So I had all their live trades in front of me, their live positions. I used to be able to see who was doing what, what orders they were working. Um, you used to be able to see everything. So I sort of learned. I, was, I used to watch the bun traders and the bobble traders. I used to have the graphs and the charts in front of me just to see what the market was doing. And I used to watch how these guys traded. I used to try and watch how uh, how big a market move there might be, how much these guys run their positions, how much they cut them for, did they average, did they build big positions. 
you know, were they waiting on key levels? I used to try and work out what most of these guys were. I couldn't work out what they were doing, but I was trying to work out, you know, patterns what they used to do. So, uh, yeah, then when I went into work for Saxon, which was the little firm, um, I become, I was a Shats trader, Shats and Bobble, and a little bit of Bund. Okay. And, you know, you'd, you'd mentioned previously that you struggled to make money uh, as a floor trader. Uh, you then went to be a risk manager, and now you're actually uh, a trader again. So how did you go as a trader? Did you still, you know, experience um, some your fair share of difficulties when you came into that role as a prop trader or were you pretty much profitable, you know, straight out of the gate? Um, I started in, I started trading again in February and I was profitable by the end of April, maybe beginning of May. Um, I just found it, I think in my time off as well from being a trader on the floor to going into the office, I learned a lot more about the actual dynamics and the mechanicals of the trading as opposed to, not really knowing enough when I went in the pit, but going back onto the screens after two years watching people trade, I thought I then had a feel for it. I could I could almost envisage what was going to happen. Not obviously I can't I couldn't tell what was going to happen, but I'd watch these guys so much day in day out. It gave me a good idea of what was going on. Right, right, okay. So who were the other guys at the firm that you were trading next to? I mean, were they more? experienced uh, bigger traders than you were at the time? Did you learn anything significant from these guys? Not really. I had a senior trader who, um, he was no more senior than me in his experience, but he'd been with the group a few months longer because the group started about three months previous to when I joined, and he became my senior trader just because he was there before me. Um, but he was, a, he was a very good guy, very um, a real good approach. He was a programmer by trade, and uh, very analytical, and he likes his, he likes his probabilities, and he he was a real good mentor to be honest to have. Even though he weren't much more experienced in trading than me, he was very calm. If ever the market went a bit haywire, he used to he used to just say sit you know sit back, hold on, don't panic. He was really he was very calm, which was it was good compared to what the people were like I dealt with before on the floor. So can you share with us perhaps your your best and your worst day while trading with this firm? I think that, that might be interesting to hear about. Um, one of my worst days was, we called it the super spike, and it was, uh, it was in the shacks. And uh, even though we knew this trade would be busted at the time, it wasn't particularly nice. Um, we all got very, very short in a very short amount of time because uh, the shat spikes 800 ticks. Um, we knew it was a, a fat finger, but it still didn't make it any nicer at the time because you just you didn't know what you'd done, and we were short quite a lot more than we should have been short, and quite a lot more again. And uh, the market did eventually come back to within 50 ticks of where the move started, and uh, they, they busted any trades above there, but we were still 50 ticks offside on quite big size and we had to work around it for the rest of the afternoon. We actually ended up making money, which was uh, it's quite amazing really, but that was one of my worst days. Okay, and what about one of your best days? Let's take it from the other side. Um, I've had lots of good days, not just financial, not just making money. I mean, I've had some good days where um, I remember there was an earthquake once and everyone thought it was an earthquake in New York and we all managed to make a lot of money on it. It wasn't, it was an earthquake out of sea, no one was hurt, nothing, you know, there was no problems, it was, just, it was a big false alarm really. Um, but that was, I think, the first few days back in January, I think I'd, I'd sat down after about 30 seconds and the news came out, and I think it was probably my best day ever. Now, in your answer there, you mentioned, uh, you used the term fat finger. I think some listeners may not be familiar with this term. Would you mind explaining that for us? Um, there's lots of different fat fingers you can do. A typical trader fat finger like I'd make would be, you know, you might try and you're trying to bid a price, so you're trying to bid a price of 52 and you accidentally lift the offer by mistake, so you buy into the offer and buy 54s or 55s, putting yourself immediately offside. And um, it's quite frustrating. But when there's a big fat finger like this particular day, 
I don't know the exact story, but the, the rumour was that someone meant to buy 2,500 shares and bought 25,000 at market, and it set off a lot of long-term stops. And I've seen lots of fat fingers like that before. I've seen um, someone in the DAX was meant to sell one lot at 3,500 and sold 3,500 at one instead and dropped it literally to nine on zero. So, you know, these, these trades normally get busted. But they do have a knock-on effect across other products and you know other other contracts, so uh, they can be they can cause a lot of problems. Okay, okay. Now during during your time working with this this small prop firm, you know you, you mentioned that you became profitable after about a few months of consistent trading. I'm sure you know as time went on, your trading began to improve uh, more and more as time went on. Were there any moments that kind of um, any like game changing moments or any aha moments that really made a big impact to your success as a trader during that time? Yeah, I can, and a lot of people are going to hate me for saying this. And uh, back in two thousand, I think the end of two thousand, maybe two thousand and one, we noticed the uh, the flipper, the Urex flipper, and uh, we. Read it. We read it very well. My group of traders. There was probably only seven or eight of us in my little group, and we read what he was doing extremely well. While we'd hear all the other traders in the office shouting, screaming, swearing, banging desks, and genuinely losing money, we actually really liked this flipper being in there. And when he wasn't in there, we used to, you know, we used to worry. We we like him in there. We used to make really good money when he was in. So when we spotted that, it was almost like a a strategy that we we knew we could make money from and it was good okay now this is probably another somewhat of a new term to to listeners and something we haven't really discussed much on the podcast what are you referring to when you when you're talking about a flipper there um the flipper it works in my opinion it works best it works best in slower moving markets then like the bobble or the shats he was big in the buns as well but he'd um you, you basically would bid a price for a a very large amount. If the average bidder offer price had five or six hundred lots on it, he would bid it for, for example, two thousand lots. Anyone short would immediately pay the next price, but he would slowly drip feed offers back in the price above where he was bid until he got enough people long and got himself short. And he would pull his big bid out and turn that big bid into a big offer. So anyone had just paid the the current offer before was now caught long and had to now sell into the price two prices lower. But we used to read it very well and take advantage of it. He changed his game a lot and he you know, the guy was very good at changing his game, but we just tried to keep changing and evolve with him. Okay, now when you say he, you're obviously talking about another really big trader who's almost kind of manipulating the market. I don't know if that's maybe the right word, but kind of pushing the price around. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't, I, you know, I know who the guy is or the group was, and they there wasn't one or one of them. I think there was a few of them, and uh, I suppose in the day, yeah, it was it was manipulating, and people hated it. You know, there was there was uproar about it because people were just losing money left, right, and centre, and he was making a lot. Um, but we read it differently to everyone else for some reason, and we we liked it. And uh, yeah, then then days it was flipping and bullying the market now I suppose and manipulating spoofing layering you know it's, it's illegal now mm-hmm, mm-hmm. okay so how long did you stay on at this prop firm before you moved on to other things I stayed there right up until 2010 so 10 years okay and then what was your next what was your next move from that point well I was, I was still a trader with Saxon which is the group I was with for 10 years um, I was also the head of trading so I'd you know, mentor and help junior traders. I'd even help senior traders, train new traders. Um, and once I'd finished trading and I found it difficult for a while, I stopped to give myself a bit of time out and I became the head of risk management there. And then when I left in 2010, I went and worked for a, another small uh, commodities firm called Tomoris. Okay, okay, interesting. Well, let's, um, let's fast forward to your situation these days. I know you're no longer living in um, the UK. Can you tell us a little bit about you know, what you're doing these days? At the minute, I run a small proprietary trading firm. 
um, graduate trainees, a few experienced guys, and um, you just uh, you know mentoring juniors, training them, helping the senior traders. We look for different strategies in the markets every day. Um, trying to you know just trying to evolve and stay with the times really. Excellent, excellent, and that's in Spain, is that correct? That's right, yeah. Awesome. Now, so let's let's move on to a little bit more about how you're actually trading today. So can you share with us how you trade now and also maybe how this has changed over the years? Um, today, mainly spread trading, mainly in, in the energy complex, WTI on NYMEX and Brent on ICE. Um, I spread trade a lot more, just find outright trading increasingly difficult and the volatility is, is, do you know what, it's just not for me anymore, maybe because I'm older. Um, but we try and take a lot of arbitrage from different products and spread stuff off on different exchanges um, and just create synthetic strategies which are more mean reverting than what the outright trading is. Okay, now I've got a bunch of questions around spread trading for you because, um, you know, again, this is something that we haven't actually really discussed on the podcast in past episodes. So I think it'll be really interesting if we can actually dive into that. So, I mean, Saul, could you like really dumb it down for us and, and explain how you make money as a spread trader? Like, what are you actually doing um, when you take a spread trade? Well, a lot of spread trades, I mean, Take the energy complex for example. There is there's so many different permutations of trades you can do. You can trade right out till I don't trade out till December 21, not 2021, but a lot of people do. Um, you you basically you're you're mitigating your risk a little bit by spreading one outright off with another or well, calendar spreads. I, I trade. I don't actually trade the outrights. But if you trade two calendars against another, you know, and one calendar against another, you're creating a fly. You can create double flies, condors, boxes. You just you're um, you're sometimes dumbing down the the range of what you're trying to trade. You're it's, you're you're taking the volatility away by spreading it off against other products or other months or other deliverables. You're just making you know, it's making it less less uh, less volatile in the long run. Okay, and when you do this, this again, you know, it's probably a newbie question. Are you, you know, so you're trading two separate contracts as as a spread trade um, from two different deliverable dates, like two different, two completely separate contracts. Are you necessarily going long one contract and short the other, or is there a, is there sometimes where you might be long or short both? No, you're always going to spread your long one and short the other. So, for argument's sake, if you had a at the minute, the front month in WTI will be April, May. So if you were to buy the April, May spread, you'll be buying April, selling May. So uh, that has a lot, much less of a a range than the actual two outright contracts in themselves. It might have a range of, for example, 20 ticks a day as opposed to 200. Um, there's a lot more size on the bids and offers. So there's, you know, there's a lot more liquidity there to, to do more size and to get in and out. Yeah, so it's just, it's, it's a safer way of trading a lot of the time. Okay, so what type of market activity are you actually monitoring to find these opportunities? I guess to, to add on to that, you know, like a technical trader may look for certain types of chart patterns. What do you look for as a spread trader? Yeah, a lot of spreads are very technical as well. Um, it depends what spreads you're looking at. Um, a lot of the oil spreads are very technical. They'll, they'll react off big levels, um, a lot of moving averages. Um, also, you, then with a physical commodity, you have to take into account the deliverables. And if you're trading things like softs, the cocos, any, uh, sugars, coffee, anything like that, you've got to worry about, well, same as oil, you've got to worry about supply and demand issues. So uh, it's fu fundamental factors massively affect the spreads. For argument's sake, the, um, you know, the, the Iran stuff now, the sanctions on Iran, you know, that affects the oil prices. Any threat of war will affect the oil prices, any cut in production will affect the oil prices, any oversupply will affect them. So they're very fundamental driven in the outrights, which then does have a knock-on effect down to the spreads. Okay, and what time frames do you operate on as a spread trader, and is speed a factor at all? For me, it's not particularly a factor. The only speed for me would be 
if I was trading a, um, synthetics, which would be one calendar against another, maybe against another, an auto spreader needs to be quick, so you get all three prices in, in one go, so you, you don't get any slippage and you get the price you wanted. Your speed's not overly a fa- it's not a big factor for me anymore. Uh, time frames, it depends again what spread you're trading. So um, some spreads move a lot more than others. It tends to be the longer the duration between the two months, for argument's sake in oil, a December 16, December 17 spread moves a lot quicker than um, a March, uh, a March, April or an April, May. So some of the, the wider dated spreads, you know, you can get quite quick moves intraday, you know, even in a few minutes, some flyers and stuff, which would be one calendar against another calendar. You, you might run them for a few days, depending on, you know, again, what duration they were. Well, one month fly. An April, uh, an April, May, June, for argument's sake, you know, you might have to wait a few days to get any decent movement out of it. But a longer duration fly, you, you know, you might get 50, 60 tick movement in a day. Okay. Now, what appeals to you about spread trading over outright directional trading? Uh, you, you sort of touched on the, the topic of, you know, risk a little bit earlier. Are there any other reasons that, that attract you to spread trading? There's, there's so many different permutations of spread trading in, in, in the oil complex. You know, there, there is so many different ways to skin a cat. There's so many uh, different spreads you can build. So if you do get in trouble with a spread and you can see what leg is hurting you, if it's a three or four legged spread, you can lighten one leg, you could take a leg off, you can, you can adjust it, you could, you could turn it into something else by cutting that leg and you know, re- adding another leg in from a different maturity is where if you've got just outrights on, you know, you're either right or you're wrong pretty much. And you've got to be so right nowadays and pick your level so well. Sure, sure. Okay. Now, I mean, when you're spread trading, does this carry, you kind of said before that it, it mitigates your risk to a certain extent. Is there any chance that it can increase your risk that over you know what you might risk as a directional trader because you could potentially be wrong on you know maybe two contracts now. Yeah, I mean, the worst case scenario for a spread trader is if, um, your long leg goes down and, and your short leg goes up. You know, you completely do the splits, and that does happen. But it's you know it's no different from an outright trade where. You either have a monetary stop or a, a stop where you say if it gets here I'm wrong, or you have some percentage stop on your account. You you know you should manage it the same way. Sure. Now that's that's a good answer there. So, is there any quantitative and or automated element to your spread trading, or is it purely discretionary? Um, I run an auto spreader, which you know that that automatic, automatically executes a lot of stuff for me. Um, I do write some code in some of my front end systems that allows me to trade automatically if, if I need to. And I do set a lot of stuff up to alert me when there's trades. And I can set it to auto, but I tend to do it manually. Okay, okay. No, that's cool. Now, are there any resources you'd recommend to someone interested in learning more about spread trading? Is there anything that's been helpful to you? To be honest, no. There's not many people you can speak to about spread trading there's not there's lots of stuff on the web and it tells you the basics of you're buying one delivery month selling another delivery month it explains the basic flies and condors and no one really tells you what you're looking for and how to you know how to implement your trades and when when to execute and why no one really tells you it's uh it's just something i've learned over the years i learned mainly as a market maker when um I was market making in 2010 for an oil company, and we just we had so many different strategies. Then we just uh, it's trial and error to see what ones you know are the best. Do you think there's a reason why it's not really discussed as as much as I guess more of directional outright directional trading is discussed? Um, that's when I sound sceptical. I know in the energy complex is. A lot of um, a lot of big funds and people don't really trade the outright as much. They trade a lot of spreads. You know, the big players trade spreads. Um, I'm not saying they don't trade outrights as well. They do, 
But uh, there's some real, real big players in the spread trading arena. I don't know. No, I don't really know if uh, there's any sort of insider club or anything like that. But uh, I know the, the big players do trade spreads. Okay. And when you bring in like new traders to your prop firm that you have there in Spain, what type of traders are they? Are they also spread traders or do they focus on other styles? They start off as outright traders. They learn about fundamentals, technicals, um, even sort of, you know, price ladder reading still because there's still a lot of um, information you can glean from reading a price ladder. I find it increasingly difficult now because it's the markets are a lot faster than when I used to be a really good price ladder reader. But no, they, they, they start off on outrights. Here's just a real short break to thank TradeStation for sponsoring this episode. Like I mentioned right at the beginning, TradeStation is a multi-market online broker with almost no limit to what you can trade. And just this year, in 2016, TradeStation was actually ranked as one of America's top five online brokers by Investors Business Daily for the fourth year in a row, which really should be little surprise considering what they have to offer clients, not only in the US, but internationally also. TradeStation's platform is renowned for providing analysis tools which were once enjoyed by professionals only, such as their radar screen, which can display hundreds of symbols in a single window allowing for dynamic, real-time scanning, sorting, and ranking for any criteria that you determine. Very powerful tool. Plus, there's also TradeStation's proprietary easy language, which gives you the ability to create custom indicators and strategies that can be backtested against a huge historical database and then even automated within the same platform if that's something you choose to do. To top it off, TradeStation also has an award-winning support team of fully licensed brokerage professionals and ultra-competitive commissions. For more info and to learn why traders trade with TradeStation, visit tradestation.com now. Now, Saul, you've worked many years as a risk manager for a couple prop firms, so let's spend a little time on this. I think it will be valuable for listeners to get some of your insight on the subject. So the first question I have around this is, were there any specific risk parameters or rules that you would not budge on in order to protect the firm's capital and, of course, the trader? Yeah, normally it was stops. I used to like to run almost like a traffic light system. So if a trader would agree a predetermined size that he could trade and the maximum he could have on, it didn't mean he had to trade that maximum all the time. But if the need be, he could trade up to an agreed size. Um, But if he had, let's say, for example, this is called a thousand pounds stop loss for the day, if he got to say 400 pounds down, I would approach him or Skype him or normally he was in the office, so I'd go and see him and just say, look, you know, you're 40% of your way towards your stop. Why don't you take it easy for a bit? Maybe cut your size, just get a little bit back. So that would be not the first warning, but that would be the first point of contact. And then if he if he got into a bit more trouble, maybe sort of 650, 700 pounds down, I'd go over to him, I'd suggest a break get out of your positions, pull your orders, clear your head for a little bit and definitely cut your size now until you get it back, 50% of your money back. And then if they got to their stop on the day, then that was pretty much nailed on. The only time I would ever budge on it is if it was a really absurd market move where something unbelievable would happen and they just got caught instantly on a blip and they got stopped out. I may let them trade again after they had a little break on reduced size and with a really tight stop for the rest of the day. But right. a lot of the time, the guys made that back. Right, okay. Now, just out of curiosity, uh, when you were a risk manager, um, I think in the, maybe the first time around, how many traders were you actually looking over and, and monitoring? Um, in total, probably about 120. Okay, okay. Now, were the risk parameters the same for everybody or how did you decide when to allocate more or less risk to certain traders? It depended on the products they traded, um, how much of a relationship we'd had with them already. You know, if it was a, a new trader who joined us from a firm recently, we'd be a lot more, you know, hands-on with him and make sure we kept an eye on him until we learned his trading style, how he dealt with losses, how he got out, you know, how much he abided by the rules we'd set him. Also, how much the trader had in his account, um, 
and obviously the size that they traded, we, you know, we used to, the rules were never the same because everyone had different stops. And certain traders, we used to give big stops because we knew if they even got to near their stop, there was a, a good chance that they'd make their money back. Right, right. Now, is there anything you've noticed that often gets overlooked by less experienced traders when thinking about risk management? Yeah, um, a lot of the time, I try and explain to trainees a lot of the time, you don't have to be right that often to actually make money. Um, you know, if, you, if you've done 10 trades, you get, and you, just you say you lost a tick on each, on nine of your trades, but you made 10 ticks on your last trade, you, know, you actually made money. So you haven't got to be right as much as people think. But your losses have obviously got to be a lot smaller than your winners. So you either you've got to cut your losses short or manage your losses and run your winners. And a lot of people struggle with getting that whole package together. So it's a combination of um, running your winners, keeping your wrist tight, and obviously, you know, just, just putting it all together in one go. You know, we often hear people talking about risk management, okay, and they say, you know, it's a very important aspect of trading, which, you know, they're definitely right. But is there more to good risk management than just where you place your stop loss and how you size your positions? Yeah, I mean, everyone's got their own opinion on risk management. I have people that say they'll have a hard and fast 3% of their account as their stop. Some people will say, you know, I want a thousand pounds stop loss. Some people say I'll have a stop loss depending on how big I trade or I'll trade this big depending on how much I'm going to risk. So there's no real hard and fast rule. Everyone does it differently. It's a tough one to call, but it's very individual. As long as you can't be too restrictive with your risk because you'll constantly stop yourself out. Um, and you obviously can't just let it run away because you need such big winners to cover the losses. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So what would you say is the key thing that separates good risk taking from bad risk taking? I know that might be a bit of a tricky question, but do you have any, any insight you could perhaps share on that? Um, some of the best traders I've ever met and, and risk managed and worked with and, you know, just had the pleasure of meeting, the best ones I always found didn't care for the money. Not they didn't care if they lost. They didn't really care about earning the money. They it was just it was just the game to them. They just um it was just about winning. So when they made money they'd won. They didn't you know, some of these guys I know made a hell of a lot of money, didn't buy anything extravagant, didn't really spend a lot of money considering how much they had earned. They didn't seem to do it for the money and when you're not doing it for the money you seem to earn more money. And when you're backed up against the wall and you need the money, you'll find it very hard to make money. Yeah, that's a really great point you bring up, Saul. I appreciate you mentioning that. And I know it's it's a really good outlook, but it, it can be quite tricky to, to get your head around. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is there anything that uh, independent traders might be able to learn or take away from someone who's on the uh, in the field of professional risk management that they can perhaps apply to their own trading? Yeah, I think you've got to take a look at your trades and say to you, you know, you've got to take a look. You, you've got to have a plan because uh, one guy in our office used to say to us, you, you, if, um, if, you, if you don't have a plan, you know, you haven't got anything. You, you, can't, you can't go anywhere without a plan. You know, fail to prepare, prepare to fail, he used to say. And um, I think as long as you've got a plan and with every trade, if you know the risk you're going to take on this trade, I don't always like to call it risk. I like to call it you know you you know you know the potential downside to it. You should never be worried about taking that trade if you know this trade has got a, a five hundred dollar risk on it or a five hundred pound risk on it. Then that's the risk you got to accept for that trade. Um, your risk reward. Uh, you hear people saying, you know, you shouldn't run anything less than a three to one, or a five to one, or whatever it may be. Now, some traders run a, a one-to-run risk of wall ratio and make a hell of a lot of money. So uh, as long as you know what your plan is and you stick to that plan and you carry it through and execute it exactly to the T with your profits and your stops, then you know that I think that is very important. It, it's not all about getting the trade right. It's, it's staying in the game and having the right risk management. 
Absolutely, yeah. Brilliant answer again. Like you mentioned earlier, you you do run a prop firm in Spain now um, and part of your day-to-day life is managing other traders. What are, the, what are some of the common mistakes you see being made by less experienced traders um, outside of managing risk? Um, a lot of the time it's accepting a loss. You get a trader who, now most traders find it hard to start with. Um, you get a, a good trader, it will make it have a good little run and there's one bad day and it seems to really affect him. But, you, you know, I tell them it's, that's part and parcel of what goes on. You're not ever going to get... You're never ever going to be a trader if you can't accept taking losses. And it, someone told me years and years ago when I was a trader on the floor as a young lad, um, it's good to accept small losses. And at the time, I thought you're mad. But he said you should enjoy taking small losses because it's much more enjoyable than taking a massive one. And it always stuck with me. And uh, I just, yeah, I think it's accepting that you will lose at some point. And you know, you will lose if you if you trade 10, 15 times a day. You're gonna there's gonna be a point during that day where you, you're wrong, but you just got to accept that you're wrong. And as long as them wrong trades aren't big, and they're not bigger than your winning trades, then you shouldn't have nothing to worry about. Excellent, excellent. I like that answer, Saul. That was that was really good. Now, just one last question I have for you here, and this is a question I've been asked a little bit lately. You know, by people sending emails and. Just asking about like what platforms do some of my guests use on their in their day to day trading? So, what is the plat the trading platform that you use, and perhaps what type of trader is this best suited to? Um, at a minute, I use CQG Trader with a spreader, and I really like it because um, everything's in one package. So I've got all my charts. I use the CQG integrated client, so I've got all my charts. Um, all my settings, all my ladders, every every single thing is the same. So if I want to type in a ladder for a DOM trader, for argument, say like a market depth trader, uh, if I want to type in a ladder for the Bund, I type in a code for the Bund, which is the same as the chart. So everything's standard. It's all the same. Um, it's got – originally CQG was a, a, a charting system and they developed it into a charting and a trading system. So – for me, it's an all-in-one package. It's light. I can even boot it up on my laptop when I'm not in the office. Uh, it's just it's just very user-friendly. It's very simple, and it's got so much functionality. Um, that's the reason I use that, and because it's good for spreading. It's good, easy to create synthetic spreads. Um, a lot of other guys I know use TT as well, which is another fantastic system. But I haven't used that for a while now because I'm more of a spread trader. Great. Okay. So CQG, is that something that can also be utilized by traders who are not um, spread traders? Yeah. I mean, there's a few different versions. You can use just a CQG trader, which uh, if I remember rightly, it just gives you four ladders. You can use CQG as a charting system on its own, or you can use the combined one, which I use is CQG integrated client. So um, yeah, anyone can use it. Any, you know, you don't it's available for anybody. Awesome. Okay. All right, so well, it's been awesome speaking with you. Thank you very much. Um, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Um, is there anywhere listeners can go to find out more about you? I know I struggled to find any information about you online um, prior to the interview, and it's thanks to Cam Dada for making this intro. So is there anywhere listeners can go to find out more about you? Um, it's not a lot about <laughs> me on the web, to be fair. Um I'm obviously on Skype as we're talking now. Um, I've got no qualms in anyone. If they want to talk, talk to me, uh, you, you're, you're more than welcome to give them my contact details. Okay. Well, let's let's do it this way. So if you guys maybe have questions or there's something you want to ask Saul, leave a comment um, in the – leave a question in the comments area on the website. Um, or if you want Saul's direct contact, just uh, email me. My email is pretty easy to find at chatwithtraders.com. And we'll just play it that way. All right, so well, once again, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this and thank you very much. You're welcome. You've come to the end of this episode of Chat with Traders, but don't worry, more great episodes are on the way. To stay updated with each great new episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast in iTunes and we'd love it if you leave us a rating and review. We'll see you next time on Chat with Traders. 